In this video, we begin our journey into chapter 13, which is chemical equilibria, starting with an introduction into the concept of chemical equilibria. And so there's the learning outcome slash expectations. Feel free to pause and take a look through those before we go on. All right, so there's the outline for chapter 13. It's fundamental equilibrium concepts. Uh, that starts with uh, chemical equilibria and just basically de defining what equilibria is. And so we've seen this reaction coordinate diagram many times. We have reaction progress down here. We have energy over here. We have A, we have B, and we have a, um, a one-step reaction. We have a transition state at the top. And so we've talked so far about, you know, the, the relationship between activation energy and rates of reactions. And it basically says if A has enough energy, it can go over this hill and transform into B. But equally important is that if there's enough energy, it can also go the opposite direction. And so this one is an exothermic reaction. It's energetically downhill. The overall delta E favors B more than A. But again, EA is just the activation energy. And so there's a rate constant associated with the reverse process, and the reverse process can occur. Note the activation energy is smaller for the forward than the reverse, but you can see still a fraction of these molecules can go the opposite direction. And so the reality is with most reactions, you're going to go both ways over this hill. And so at some point, even if you start out with all A or all B, at some point you're going to re reach a condition where the number of A's turning into B's equals the number of B's turning into A's. The rate of the forward and reverse reactions become equal. And so that's a, a circumstance which we call equilibrium. It's a chemical equilibrium where A transforms to B and B transforms into A. And so the formal definition of chemical equilibrium, a reversible process where the reaction rates in both directions are equal. So that system gives an appearance of having a static composition. And so um, just breaking this down further, it basically says the reaction is reversible. It can go one way, it can go the other way, which is always true, but not necessarily as favorable going both directions. Uh, the system is closed. If you have matter leaving the system, it can never reach this equilibrium condition. But if it is a closed system and the reaction is reversible, at some point the rate of forward and reverse reactions will become equal. And so on a, on a molecular level, chemical change is occurring. A is turning to B, B is turning to A, molecular, molecules are changing. But on average, the concentration of the reactants from products remain constant. And so the way we depict this chemically, everything we've shown to date, when we have A and B, we've shown a unidirectional arrow where A transforms into B. But if the reaction is reversible, we do a double-sided arrow that looks something like this. There's a few different versions of it, but in general, it's a half arrow on top, half arrow on bottom, and that depicts that a chemical equilibrium or an A to B and a B to A reaction can happen simultaneously. And it's very important to note what equilibrium is not. And so, uh, Equilibrium does not mean the concentration of reactants and products are equal. In fact, that's rarely the case. It's going to favor reactants, it's going to favor products, depending on the driving force or the delta G, as we'll get into in chapter 16. And so rarely are the concentrations of reaction products equal. It's just that the rate of the forward and reverse processes are equal. The other thing to note is that on a macroscopic level, it doesn't look like things are changing, but the molecules themselves are changing. It's just they're changing in both directions. So it looks like on average, Average, nothing is happening. And so again, it gives the appearance of a static composition. And so macroscopically, if we look at the solution, the concentration of A stays the same, the concentration of B stays the same, but there's still dynamic processes. There's still A to B to reactions, there's B to A reactions, but the rate is equal, so it gives the appearance that nothing is actually changing. And so just give, give you a cartoonish depiction of that, we have a square in equilibrium with a circle, and they're transforming into each other. And it's convenient in this depiction, they're all changing at the same time, but that's not necessarily what's happening. But the, the take home message is where you start, where you end, and there is no end in this case. Anytime you measure it, when it's at equilibrium, you will have four squares and four circles on average. Now there might be moments where this is six and this is, or this is five and this is three, but on average, you're gonna have four of each of these species. And the reason is the rate of square turning to circle is equal to the rate of circle turning to square. And so they're always going back and forth reaching that equilibrium condition. Because if all the squares turned into circles, then the rate of the reverse process Process, a circle going to square would increase and they'd eventually match out again. And so that's what reaching equilibrium is. And so that's squares and circles. You can see this reaction with a red sphere and two blue spheres joining together to give you this. Um, 
Not sure what this reaction is, but uh, you guys get the idea. Under steady state conditions, six reds, six of the, the double blues, and then three of the red and blues. And so you'll notice the concentration of product is not equal to the concentration reaction, but the concentration stays constant throughout the course of the reaction after it reaches equilibrium. And so uh, reds are turning into red blues and, and blues are turning into blue reds. And it, it's the transformation is happening constantly but on average, you're ending up with these numbers. And so what does this look like graphically? And so previously we talked about A to B reactions where we were converting all of A into B and it basically there's no A left over as this reaction proceeds. And you can see A basically disappears, B forms in and gets the maximum concentration possible. Now in an equilibrium uh, reaction that doesn't heavily favor reactants or products, you have both happening, right? And so the graph ends up looking something more like this. You start with only A, you're going to transform into B, A goes away, B grows in, but you'll notice A doesn't disappear and B doesn't take over the entirety of the concentration. And so neither of them are completely consumed during the reaction. They just reach a steady state condition where there's a certain equilibrium concentration and it's still turning A's into B's, but it's matching both directions. And so it looks like it's a steady state concentration and it is a steady state concentration, even though individual atoms and molecules are changing. And so that threshold, when you've reached this plateau, that's where you've reached equilibrium. And so anything before that is non-equilibrium. The system isn't happy. The rates of forward and reverse aren't matching. After that line, you are at an equilibrium condition. And so here's a real example, N2O4 in equilibrium with two NO2s. Um, so if you start out with pure NO2, eventually you're going to reach this point where NO2 plateaus and then N2O4 plateaus. Also starting with N2O4, that goes away, NO2 forms, but you also reach this plateau. And starting with a mixture of the two, if that mixture isn't at an equilibrium concentration, the rates of forward and reverse are going to keep changing until they match and make um, the same rate of forward and reverse. And so N2O4 increases, NO2 decreases. And so again, you can see with this line, that's where it's reached that equilibrium threshold. And so no matter where you start, if this reaction is bidirectional, if you give it enough time, eventually it's going to reach a condition where the rate of forward and the rate of reverse are the same. N2O4 turning into 2NO2, 2NO2 is combining to give you an N2O4, eventually it's going to reach that equilibrium condition. But something to note about these is the concentration ratios are not always the same. And so it depends on where you start. In this one, I mean, you can see in all of them, N2O4 is larger than NO2, um, but then it, the, the proportionality is not always the same. Like here, there's a more than double the amount. Here you can see they're relatively similar. And so it does depend on where you're starting and what this uh, the stoichiometry of this equation is. And so we have this chemical equilibrium where if you give a system enough time, it's going to reach equilibrium eventually, but there are some exceptions to that rule. And one is if you don't have enough of a certain reactant or product, right? And so you can see this graph here. You're starting with a whole bunch of A, a little bit of B, and a little bit of C. If A reacts and, and B runs out, like there's none of it left, there's going to be a plateau, but it's artificial. It hasn't reached equilibrium. It's essentially A can't turn into C because there's not enough B to react with. And so if you don't have enough reactant or product, you're never going to reach equilibrium, right? In fact, if there's zero of B, this reaction can't happen. And whatever your starting concentration of A and C are, that's what it's going to stay as. Alternatively, if you don't give it enough time, and there's a lot of reactions that take a really, really long time. And so if you set up a reaction here and your 100th birthday is somewhere here, unless you live to be 300 years old, you will never see this system reach equilibrium. And so there's games you could play with like, you know, adding a catalyst and making it go faster, but sometimes equilibrium, it's very slow to get there. And so, yeah, you might not have enough time to see that system reach equilibrium. The other thing, and we mentioned it earlier, if it's not a closed system, it completely breaks this equilibria because you're essentially taking out reactants or products as the equilibrium is happening. And so it has to be a closed system. Otherwise, you're perturbing the concentrations just based on those molecules exiting the system. And so uh, there's reasons you intentionally do this, and we'll talk about it in Le Chatelet's principle, but it's, it's, it's perturbing the equilibrium and not letting them reach that equilibrium state.
And so again, equilibrium does not mean the concentrations are equal. It just means the rate of forward and rate of reverse reaction are equal. And so what's important about this is we've already talked about rates of reactions, right? We have a rate law where the rate of A going to B is the rate constant of A times the concentration of A, assuming this is a single step. The rate of B going to A is equal to the rate constant of B times the concentration of B. And so we have rates associated with going each direction over this hill. And so at equilibrium, we know that the rate of forward equals rate of first. And so rate of A to B equals rate of B to A. And so we can substitute this in and we can take the other side of our rate law and we can put it on this side, put the other rate law on this side, and we can rearrange this around. And so all of a sudden what we've done is we've created a ratio of equilibrium or our um, reaction rate constants and concentrations. And so because each one of these is a constant at a given temperature, we can combine those and generate a new constant. And so in this case, we're going to take these lowercase k's of the uh, forward reaction and the reverse reaction, and we're going to make them a uppercase k. And so in this case, we are talking about the equilibrium constant. And so these are rate constants for the rate of forward and the rate of reverse. That's for the rate of a unidirectional reaction. K is combining those together and giving you an equilibrium constant. It's a ratio between K forward and K reverse and a ratio of products to reactants. And so this equilibrium constant equation, uh, it, it holds true for all reactions. And so for any general reaction, A plus B giving you C plus D, you're gonna draw the equilibrium constant equation like this. It's essentially equilibrium constant is equal to products to the stoichiometry over reactants to the stoichiometry. And so in this case, the stoichiometry comes directly from the equation. And so C to the lowercase c, D to the lowercase d, A to the lowercase a, B to the lowercase b. And so this side on top, uh, here the a and b are on the denominator. And this is sometimes known as the law of mass action. And so it basically says your equilibrium constant is a proportionality between the products to the stoichiometry and the reactants reactants to the stoichiometry. And so uh, one thing to note about this is that this, this tells you the ratio of products when you reach equilibrium. And so again, you're taking our rate constant of forward, rate constant of verse, that ratio gives you this capital K, and that capital K tells you the ratio between these products. Um, one thing to note is, uh, and some people are very meticulous about the units you put on things, uh, equilibrium constant K is weird because generally we don't include equilibrium constants. And so it doesn't matter how many molarities per liter you have on top or bottom, K we typically report just as a number. And so going back to that example we had earlier, N2O4 going to 2NO2, we saw that it ended in several different places. And so we had this equilibrium equation where it's products over reactants. So the question is, why are we ending at different points? And so we can look at this reaction and say, okay, if I start out with 0NO2 and end up and start with a bunch of N2O4, um, which is essentially this reaction right here, or I can start with a mixture of the two, which is essentially this reaction here, you can see both of them change their initial concentrations, they, the ratio between them changes, and you can reach this equilibrium concentration here. And you'll notice that this equilibrium concentration is not the same, right? Just like we saw in this graph, uh, depending on where you start, it changes where you end. And so the thing about this is the ending point is dictated by this equation that we saw earlier. And so the equilibrium constant is equal to NO2 to the 2 over N2O4. And so the reason they don't all end in the same place is this exponent right here. It essentially says it's not just the proportionality of N2O4 to NO2, it's NO2 squared over N2O4. And so if we plug our concentrations into this at equilibrium, so these numbers right here into this equation, we find that we always get the same value. And that's because it has reached an equilibrium condition. And so the, the equilibrium constant for this reaction is 4.6 times 10 to the minus 3. And so regardless of where you start, this ratio will always hold true at that equilibrium point. So after you've reached equilibria, this proportionality will always be true. And the value of that proportionality will be 4.6 times 10 to the minus 3. And so again, no matter where you start, at a given equilibrium and assuming there's no extenuating circumstance that prevents it from reaching equilibrium, you will always end up with a ratio equal to 4.6 times 10 to the minus 3 for this equilibrium here.
And so, yeah, K lends a lot of insights into this, this ratio of reaction, reactants to product. And so if you think about this K number, right, it, it's, 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 it's telling you directly the, uh, or, or uh, proportionally what the ratio between products and reactants is. And so if K is very large, it means the numerator is large and the denominator is small. If that's the case, it tells us we have a whole lot of products and not a whole lot of reactants. It also tells us that the K forward is fast, or the rate constant for the forward reaction is bigger than the the rate constant for the reverse reaction. And so sometimes this is depicted in an equilibrium arrow where you say this is favoring products, so we want to draw a bigger arrow this way, and it favors reactants less, so a smaller arrow. Likewise, if K is very, very small, where this number is small, this number is large, it favors reactants a lot. You see a lot more reactants than products. K, the forward rate constant is less than the reverse rate constant. And so it heavily favors the reactant side of this. And so just seeing the number K, if it's one, they're proportional. The concentration of rea uh, reactants and products is the same. If it's greater than one, it favors products. If it's less than one, it favors reactants. The bigger the difference from that K equals one, the more it favors products. So it's 10,000, it favors it more than say a K of 100. And so that number directly tells you about how much it favors products versus reactants. Again, the larger, the K, the more it favors products, the smaller the K, the more it favors reactants. And so it tells us which way it's racing on that hill, which way does it favor more, left or right? It's, it has the same rate when it reaches equilibrium, but it's favoring generating more of the products or the reactants. All right, so that closes out our introduction to equilibria. Again, we have reactions that can go both directions. Uh, at some point, the forward and the reverse rate are equal, and that's going to be dictated by the rate constant and the concentration. And so we can rearrange that and come up with the law of mass action equation, where we have a capital K, which is the equilibrium constant, is equal to the ratio of products over reactants and both to the stoichiometry. And so we have an equilibrium constant. That constant tells us something. If that number is large, it favors products. If it's small, it favors reactants and everything in between. And so that allows us to start really discussing about equilibria and then eventually perturbing those equilibria. And so, yeah, that closes out our introduction to equilibria. Next, we'll get into the equilibrium constants and, and how you can use those to do useful things.